Notebook 7 The Bloody and Futile Offensive of September 25 From the 27th of September, 1915, to the 15th of November, 1915 Part 1 It was the 27th of September. Two days previously a general offensive had begun across the front, with hundreds of thousands of men fighting and dying in the nightmare that is trench warfare. Barthas's 280th Regiment had been placed under the command of General Niesel, a brute who seemed to be disconnected with the reality of the battle, and who had ordered the regiment to attack a village called Farbu, which could not be found. After much searching and asking around, it was discovered that this mysterious village lay somewhere deep behind enemy lines, and it was impossible to attack and take it, especially at night with no artillery support. In the end, the regiment fell back a kilometre and a half to the village of neuville saint vast and so we returned to where we left off. The village of neuville saint vast was nothing more than a pile of ruins. Barthas' section was housed in a mouldy cellar under what had once been a lawyer's house. The cellar was filled with unspeakable waste and gave off a nauseating stench. In the middle of the filth, each soldier used his entrenching tools to clear a small spot on which to lie down and rest after their twelve-hour march through the trenches. In the afternoon, Barthas was paid a visit by a good friend of his, a man called Gairo, who served as the colonel's personal barber, but who still nominally belonged to the 13th squad, and whose real loyalties lay with the 13th squad. As Barthas said, the squad is like a little family, a center of affection where deep feelings prevail, of solidarity, of mutual devotion, intimacy and from which the officer and even the sergeant are excluded. To them, the soldier doesn't open up, is mistrustful, and any officer who will want to try to describe the strange life of the trenches, as I'm doing, will never have known, except by accident, the real sentiments, the true spirit, the clear language, and the deepest thoughts of the soldier. The colonel had named Gairol his personal orderly, so as to always have his barber at hand, and from this position Gairo learned all the inside news, news which he quickly passed on to the squad. Knowing that Barthas was writing the story of their suffering, he would bring him precious bits of intelligence that not even their superior officers knew. The news this time were not good. General Niesel was going to send them again to attack the village of Farbu, and this time, to prevent the previous day's confusion, the runners had carefully scouted out their path through the maze of communication trenches. The regiment was going to move out at 5 p.m. The exact time of the attack would be kept secret from the men until the very last moment, for morale purposes. This was because their officers did not believe the men would allow themselves to be led to the slaughter without knowing why or how. At 4.30 p.m. they received the evening meal, far earlier than usual. A man joked that they were being spoiled, but Barthas knew the truth. They had barely finished eating when, to the surprise of most, the officers suddenly ordered them to hoist their packs. Ten minutes later the regiment was moving through three different communication trenches towards Farbu they would attack flanked left and right by other regiments of the division. But, without warning, the regiment had to stop at a crossroads between two trenches. It turned out that another battalion was moving up towards the front line, and they had to make way for it. After the other battalion had passed, the regiment resumed its march, but soon had to stop again and they had to cram themselves into a dead-end trench to make way for units that were being relieved and going back to the rear lines. This repeated itself over and over again for hours. The trenches were a hive of activity, with units constantly moving around. They had still not reached their positions when night fell, together with a torrential rain which chilled them to the bone, 
and turned the trenches into a mess of mud. They were still marching when, out of nowhere, shots pierced the air and bullets whizzed above, soon followed by cries and shouts. There was complete confusion. It turned out that the 23rd Company, which went ahead of their own 21st Company, had unwittingly passed their own forward listening posts into no man's land, and had fallen right into a German trench, which welcomed them with a storm of bullets. Now this may need some explanation. Many have the idea that no man's land was only an open field, constantly swept by machine gun fire. But many times this could not be farther from the truth. Two opposing forces could end up occupying different parts of the same trench system, especially during an offensive such as this. This would make it so both sides were separated by a maze of communication trenches, shell holes and ditches, and one could knowingly or not walk through the trenches and find oneself face to face with enemy positions. Though, this time, it seemed that the terrible fortune of the 23rd Company had been no accident. Apparently, out of fear that they wouldn't attack, their officers had decided to push the men beyond their forward positions without telling them, with the idea that once the Germans were on top of them, there would be no choice but to attack. Bartha said that this vile trick could have had terrible consequences, and it showed the villainous mentality of their leaders. It did nothing to raise their superiors' prestige in the soldiers' eyes, nor to diminish the mistrust they had for them. When they came under fire, the men of the 23rd Company hit the ground until the firing subsided, and then they rushed back in disarray, throwing the regiment into panic confusion. The 23rd Company had many dead and wounded that day. After that event, at around midnight, Barthes's company found itself in a part of the trenches which was completely collapsed and devastated by artillery fire. Not even the deepest dugouts had been saved. This had been the German front line which the French troops had taken during the 25th of September. They had to spend the night there. With daybreak, a terrible scene was revealed to the Poilus. In front and behind the trench, the ground was covered with hundreds of French corpses. Complete lines and entire ranks had been mowed down. This had been the terrible price paid for an advance of four or five hundred meters. Barthas calculated that it had been something like one human life per square meter. And their dispatches sang of their glorious victories. That day, Barthas was exploring a nearby communication trench when he made a turn and suddenly found himself face to face with a German. The man was sitting down, his leg badly wounded and his eyes swollen shut. The German looked terrified at Barthas. Kamhad! Kamhad! he stammered. Barthas got closer, saw the man's state, and gave him a couple of sips of peppermint schnapps which comforted him greatly. It seemed that the German had expected the point of a bayonet instead of a helping hand. Then Barthas went and brought back his squad comrades. The German was fed, refreshed with a swig of pinard, and led along the trench back to their line. It turned out that this was the 13th squad's first prisoner. The German had an astounded look on his face at their help. Right at that moment, their commandant Kansgram passed by the trench. He demanded to know what all the fuss was about. Barthas explained about the wounded German they had found. Kansgram immediately said he was not interested and left. Barthas was very angry at the apathy of their higher ups, for whom one life, more or less, was nothing. The stretcher bearers said they would only take care of the German wounded until after they had taken away all the French ones. It was terribly unfair from a humanitarian point of view, though militarily it made perfect sense. Eventually, before nightfall, their wounded German, together with others who had been found in the communication trenches, were taken back to the dressing station. After this, at 4 p.m., the Poilus received orders to hoist their packs. 
No one knew what they were going to do, whether they were going to relieve another unit, be repositioned, or attack again the phantom village of Farbu, which no one had managed to spot all day long despite their best efforts. They followed the main trench to their left, and then Bartha's section alone had to enter a deep, narrow communication trench and go forward. The scene that was revealed to them was terrible. Perhaps there had been hand-to-hand -hand combat here, for the trench was full with the bodies of Frenchmen and Germans. Death had caught them in every conceivable position, lying, kneeling, crouching down, and the trench was so narrow that the Palous were forced to walk on the corpses. It was nightmarish. Suddenly, right in front at the head of the section came a burst of grenade blasts, followed by screams, cries and moans. Voices yelled, Fall back! It's the Boches! Run like hell! It turned out that their communication trench led right into the main German trench. Their column had come up against a German advance party, which proceeded to massacre them with hand grenades. The men had been advancing carelessly, expecting to relieve another squad of Frenchmen, not face enemies in a narrow, corpse-filled trench. It had been another dirty trick by their leaders. They had not warned them that they would bump into Germans for fear that the soldiers would refuse to advance if told so, and so no precautions had been taken. Bartha said that this showed how there was no reciprocal confidence. Their interests were completely different. Their bosses were interested only in chalking up a success, of making the effort worthwhile, while the men, who had everything to lose and nothing to gain, the men who didn't even know why they were there, they were looking only to escape all the danger they could. It was human nature. The narrow trench was filled with the sounds of the massacre, and the column was slow to turn around. Each terrified soldier tried to clamber out of the trench and make his way back to the French trenches through the brush in the open country. Barthas tried to do the same thing, but the weight of his pack made it impossible, and he struggled to unbuckle the strap while the sounds of the massacre got closer. Finally, he managed to drop his pack and get out of the trench. He was one of the last to do so before the Germans swept through the trench. Night was falling, and Barthas managed to make his way back without being spotted. He arrived at a trench occupied by the 108th Infantry Regiment. The soldiers had been alerted by their cries, had affixed bayonets, and were ready to fire. Hurry up, they called out to Barthas. Get out of our line of fire! These soldiers explained why their section had found Germans in that communication trench and showed Barth as the way back to the trenches occupied by the 280th Regiment. After ten minutes, Barth has arrived at the entrance of the horrible trench. There, their cowardly new captain was saying, It is shameful what happened out there. Get back out into the trench. But nobody moved. Barthas wrote that if Crow Maryville had put himself at the front, they would have followed him. At that moment, a soldier in the section called Agusol, an epileptic who for some time had shown signs of mental weakness, finally broke. Hearing that they were being ordered back into the nightmarish trench, he advanced on the captain and swung out an empty musette bag at him by the straps smacking the captain in the face and knocking his spectacles off. Then he charged off into the trench, shouting, disappearing into the night while singing the verses of a battle song. After that, everything was silent. They found Agusol's body the next day, riddled with bullets. But going back to that night, the soldiers had to make their way back into the trench. This time their grenadiers were at the head of the column, continuously lobbing grenades as they advanced. They spotted no Germans, but it was obvious they would be waiting for them at the main trench. Someone decided that it would be a good idea to stop 50 meters before reaching it and wait for orders. They did so. From that moment the daily rain began 
and it fell all night long in a heavy downpour. The attack was postponed until the next day. With no shelter whatsoever, they spent a miserable night shivering and soaked the bone while surrounded by corpses. Parthas wrote that they envied the dead men, for at least they were not suffering any longer. Each squad took turns standing watch at the head of the column. At around midnight, their sub-lieutenant Malvezi, who prudently kept himself at the very rear of the section, passed a note which the soldiers read together with their sergeant a man called Faur. Malvezi's note ordered them to move up the trench. The men started to protest violently at this. They did not want to advance any more. The sergeant did not know what to do, and Bartha suggested that he write the following reply. The men asked that the section chief lead them at the head of the column. When Sub-Lieutenant Malvezi received this answer, he prudently decided not to press the matter further. Bartha said Malvezi would have to earn his second lieutenant's stripe on his own. The men were not interested in earning it for him. At first light, they were relieved by another section and sent back to the nearest trench, practically at the entrance to the place where they had been. They discovered an abandoned German officer's shelter and occupied it. In the shelter they found some illustrated German newspapers. Bartha was very interested in the newspaper's caricatures. In one of them the French commander-in-chief Joseph Joffre was shown sleeping on a bed while his entire body dripped with sweat, made of all the blood he had caused to flow in useless offensives. Another one showed Joffre advancing on horseback at the head of a vast army, which was halted by an insurmountable wall of barbed wire, where there were only three or four German machine gunners with bottles of beer under their arms and enjoying a snack while firing their machine guns and producing a mountain of slaughtered Frenchmen. After checking these newspapers, the soldiers were ready to spend a good night of rest in that shelter, but they soon received news that General Niesel had decided on another assault for that very afternoon, at 5 p.m. They made their way back into the same communication trench they had just spent the whole night in. There was a long wait, and then the order to fix bayonets. A written order from their commandant Kansgran was passed up the line which told the officer in the lead section to report back every ten minutes on what was happening. The police, who without scruple had unfolded and read the note, were enraged. Their commandant was extremely curious about what happened, yet he was a coward whose nose could not be seen anywhere near danger. Wrath voices cried, Let him come up here himself. To see what happens, let him get out of his hole. One soldier tore the note to pieces to the approving laughter of the ones watching. They all came to the same resolution. The men would not get out of their trench, and they would not attack. The word was passed to the front and rear of the column at least twenty times. Bartha said that perhaps some would call that cowardice, but he asked if it was not criminal to mount an attack against thirty, while defended trenches protected by thick barbed wire entanglements without the slightest artillery support. Across the front the offensive had already failed miserably. Only General Niesel persisted day and night with more attacks. Niesel had failed in taking his primary objectives. Now he wanted to at least have Farbu, something, anything he could show off as an achievement. While the soldiers waited in the trench, Father Galo, who was right next to Barthas, told him that if the order to attack came, then his priestly conscience would compel him to go forth even if he were completely alone. I have one favor to ask you, he said. If I'm killed in the attack, I beg you not to leave me unburied out there. Nothing horrifies me more than the thought of being prey to the rats and the crows. Barthas was unmoved. He answered, Do you seriously think that if you're crazy enough to go out there on your own, we are going to risk our lives to pull your body off the barbed wire. 
This bothered Father Gallo. He thought for a moment and then asked Barthas, Would you give me a counter-order to come back to the trench after the order comes to attack? Sure, promised Barthas, if that's what you need. I'll even grab you by your coattails and haul you back into the trench. Having reconciled his patriotic priestly duties with the desire for self-preservation, Father Gallo went back to clicking his rosary beads. Night fell, and still the men waited anxiously for the order to attack, their nerves on edge. Private Vial, from Barthes' squad, was nervously opening and closing the breech of his rifle and accidentally hurt his hand in the process. A sergeant, who had previously denounced Barthes as an anti-militarist, started accusing the private of having wounded himself on purpose. Despite Viel's vehement protests, he was sent back to the squad with his wounded hand. It was 9 p.m., the men had been waiting for four hours, and still no order had come. No one knew what the long wait meant. But then, in the trench, appeared their friend, the barber Gairo. Gairo had guessed their deep anxiety, and had come determined to tell them what he knew. It turned out there were some good news. The 23rd Company, which was supposed to launch the attack, had refused to march. Its captain, a man called Darnodi, together with the section chiefs, had gone to explain the situation to the commandant. They had been telephoning the colonel and Nissel, but the general demanded that the attack be carried out and made the captain personally responsible for it. So, the captain threw himself over the top, completely alone, and fell ten paces from the trench, gravely wounded. His arm had to be amputated. In the end, with all this, the attack was postponed and the soldiers sheathed their bayonets. As a punishment for not wanting to attack, the men were given picks and shovels and were made to spend the night digging a communication trench right there, without it mattering that it would be a useless position. At daybreak, the commandant sent the battalion's adjutant, the Periwesa François Calvet, to check on the work they had done. He had barely entered the trench when a stray bullet tore his shoulder badly. If it had been one centimeter closer, it would have killed him outright. But Calvet did not seem bothered by this at all. My wound might save the lives of others, he said, because before I am evacuated, I'll say in my report that this communication trench is in full view of the Bosches and open to enfilading fire. The Palouse had worked ten hours for nothing, but Barthas deeply appreciated the generosity of spirit that Calvet showed where many others, caught up in the emotions of being wounded and the joy of getting out of the war, would not have had. The soldiers were sent to a frontline trench for 24 hours of so-called rest, which were spent in work details all day long, while at night the company got orders to bury the dead who lay on the ground between the lines since the assault of the 25th and 26th of September. The dead men were divided into different areas, and the squads drew lots for them. Barthes' squad drew a lucky hand, and only had six corpses very close to the trench to get rid of. The work was quick. Each body was pushed into a shell hole and then covered with a few shovelfuls of dirt. As corporal, Barthas was the one who had to take off the identity tags from the bodies. It was grim work. Some corpses had their tags on their wrists, others in their necks and some in their pockets. The Poilus were extremely uncomfortable at having to dig through a dead man's pockets, pat him down and use a knife or scissors to cut the chain which held the tag. It felt like profanation, and they all spoke in whispers, as if afraid of waking up the dead men. Another squad had far worse luck. They had to take care of the corpses in the horrible communication trench the ones that the soldiers had been marching and trampling over for three days. It took the squad all night to dig out the half-crushed, broken, collapsed bodies, mixed in with dirt, bags, knapsacks. In many parts it all formed a single, blood-soaked 
muddy mess. And when all this corpse work was over, the Poilus did not even have a single drop of water to wash their hands with, instead having to rub them with dirt as best they could. Still, Bartha said that their initial repugnance softened. Living in filth, the Poilus had become lower than animals. The next morning, October 1st, their section had to take up post in that same communication trench. The squads took turns to be at the frontmost position. At this point, a simple barricade of sandbags in the trench was the French border. Barthas's 13th squad had to be there from 7 p.m. until midnight, and had the bad luck that during their guard, the order came to move the barricade forward. It seemed this order was so that in the next day's communique, it could be reported that progress had been made. The soldiers did not know how far ahead the Germans were. They could very well be ambushed and massacred in that terribly dark night where nothing could be seen two paces ahead. Barthas told his squad, We need a volunteer to be a lookout, a couple of paces ahead of us. But the dark trench ahead was truly frightening. At first, no one volunteered, but then Father Galo accepted the dangerous task and waited out there as a sentinel, alone in the dark while the barricade was erected. The next morning at 4 a.m. they were relieved and finally sent back to reserve positions near the ruins of Neuville saint vaast That night they could finally rest in individual holes after seven nights where they had only had one hour to sleep at a time having to constantly stand watch, work, bury dead, and prepare for attacks. The 13th squad had not lost a single man during those seven days, but the next day a private Gerard was hit in the leg by a stray bullet while carrying water. The stretcher bearers who picked him up told them that the regiment was losing on average ten men a day either killed or wounded. Barthas was certain that if they had listened to their mad general, they would have been losing a hundred men a day. In the night of the 4th to the 5th of October, they were sleeping when they were suddenly woken up by cries to grab their arms and packs. Two men from each squad were given grenades, two were given cartridges, and two more were given rations. It seemed that Niesel was planning something new, and they soon learned that a general attack was to be launched at daybreak. At 2 a.m., they were posted near the front line in a communication trench so narrow it was impossible to sit or crouch down. Torrential rain fell, and hours passed with nothing happening. At around noon, their superiors remembered the men had not eaten anything except their meager supper the evening before, and authorized them to eat their rations but this seemed to be little more than a joke. Some soldiers managed to nibble the hard biscuits they carried in their packs, biscuits which had already been gnawed on by rats. The rest could eat nothing. At this point of the war, chocolate was not part of their rations, and all they had were raw beans, rice, coffee, and sugar, which they had no way of cooking. The soldiers waited, immobile and silent. Total silence seemed to rule the battlefield itself, with nothing but the occasional cannon fire that was muted by the fog. Finally, at around five in the afternoon, Barthas was passed an oath. He was nervous at first, but soon saw that it was from their good comrade Gairo, giving them some inside news. It turned out that the 5th Battalion was supposed to launch the attack, but its commandant, a man called de Fajol, had judged success to be impossible and had emphatically refused to attack despite the anger of the general. The attack did not take place and they would be pulled back to the village of Meril. Finally, their torture was over. After 15 hours of standing immobile in the narrow trench in a half-crouch and after three and a half hours of marching, they reached the village half dead with fatigue. They wandered around Maruil for an hour, looking for a billet because no one had expected them. In the end, their section ended up sleeping in a hovel half demolished by shells. But 
It had been so bad out there in the trenches that they did not complain and slept deeply. I do think this is a good spot to stop for now. We are seeing how, in this meaningless war, many superior officers are creating nothing but suffering for the soldiers, trying to manipulate the ones under their command through the vilest of tricks to carry out meaningless attacks that give nothing but a few hundreds of meters of worthless ground while consuming thousands of lives. Only General Niesel could fill an entire book with his stupid ideas and lack of preparation or organization. And I can guarantee we have not yet seen the last of him. We will continue this story in the next episode. Until then, I hope you all remain well. Farewell for now.